Um, as uh, you know, my, my uh, title of this talk is From COVID-19 to Cardiology, How Well Does Science Really Self-Correct? Um, I, I was going to say I have nothing to disclose and then add that I have uh, the same last name and blood ties to one of your, uh, of your cardiologists, but now you all know that. Um, but no financial disclosures. So um, has science really come to this? Uh, there's a lot, uh, we've heard a lot about fake news in, in the news media. There's, there's an alarming amount of fake news in science. Uh, for example, this is a story about a fellow named Ali Reza Haidari, who built an extensive resume and a huge uh, CV of published literature uh, in, in his field uh, on the strength of a bogus academic affiliation. Not only did he have no ties to this university, the university, California South, University in Los Angeles doesn't even exist. Um, some of, uh, of uh, Haidari's papers uh, appeared in uh, the omics journals. And if you've ever heard of the omics journals, they're a predatory publisher that was actually sanctioned uh, by the US government, uh, publishes uh, studies, including ones on uh, flying pigs. Um, This was a, a more recent story. Um, the Global Times wrote uh, an article about a Chinese journal um, that published a couple of papers by a researcher um, in Henan province who claimed that she had, uh, she and her colleagues had turned uh, more than 40 boiled chicken eggs into raw ones. This appeared in the journal Pictorial Geography. And you can wonder why, and I don't have an answer for you, um, uh, they, they would be interested in, in, a, in an article or two about uh, reversing, uh, reverse engineering chickens. So it has science become overheated uh, this is a, a recent study, uh, an article in PNAS, um, which uh, argued that most analyses of misinformation focus on popular and social media, but the scientific enterprise faces a parallel set of problems from hype and hyperbole to publication bias, citation misdirection, predatory publishing, uh, and filter bubbles. And I'll get into uh, a lot of these things uh, as the talk goes on. Um, so we have been tracking at Retraction Watch uh, the retraction of papers on COVID-19 since the pandemic began. We're up to uh, 124 is today's count. Probably by tomorrow, we'll be at 125. Um, so what does this really mean though? Should we be alarmed? So on the, on the yes side of the ledger, uh, we've seen a tremendous amount of, of re new research uh, about COVID-19. Um, a lot of it is, is very shoddy, rushed, um, shortcuts, fraudulent even, um, and, uh, and that's clearly a problem. On the other hand, um, uh, on the other hand, people are paying a lot more attention and science, you could say, is, is working as it should by catching these things. So um, it's hard to know whether we're at the, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're seeing a, a massive epidemic of, of um, bad or um, even or bad research or even misconduct, um, but we are certainly seeing uh, a large number of retractions. Um, on the other hand, uh, the if you had three, uh, we do obviously need speed in this case. Um, the, the, the amount of, of critical research that's been conducted over the last uh, year or so uh, has been extraordinary and led to some you know, amazing results, including vaccines, uh, potential therapies, uh, understanding of the virus, so um, we can be forgiven for uh, for rushing. Rushing is clearly necessary in a case like this, um, and uh, it's not necessarily um, different from from other uh, from other situations. So. Um, I'd like to get into a little bit about why we launched Retraction Watch. So we started this blog uh, in August of 2010. So we're midway through our 11th year. Uh, at the time, I was the editor of a publication called Anesthesiology News, which is a sister publication to Gastroenterology and Endoscopy News. Uh, and we broke a story about a fellow up at Bay State Medical Center named Scott Rubin, who was an anesthesiologist and a pain medicine specialist. 
And uh, Scott had been involved in a variety of multicenter trials looking at multimodal analgesia to treat uh, post-operative pain after, say, uh, uh, knee surgery or hip replacement surgery, that sort of thing. Uh, what nobody knew uh, was that Scott had been completely fabricating his data in what amounted to about 20 published papers. Um, he simply just made up his patients. This came out during a, uh, a routine um, uh, sort of uh, research week at his institution where the, the dean was looking through projects and somehow figured out that things weren't quite right. So that turned out to be a major story, major misconduct case, eventually wound up in the New York Times, some might've seen it. Scott wound up going to jail uh, having to pay a restitution of about $360,000 to Pfizer, uh, who, um, who had funded some of his trials with Celebrex. Uh, and uh, he lost his medical license, no longer a practicing physician. So uh, at the time, Ivan Ransky, uh, who is my partner on this endeavor, uh, was the editor of the online edition of Scientific American. And they covered it. Uh, and uh, it turned into a big story for them. And so he and I were talking some months later, and uh, he suggested that we do a blog about retractions. He had been blogging about embargoes, which is another aspect of, uh, of science journalism, which is sort of interesting, but not my thing. Uh, and so I said, sure, because at the time that was the only, I think we'd covered one other retraction case. Uh, and uh, I figured if we had to write about one retraction or two retractions a year, it really wouldn't be that much time. Well, we quickly realized that there were significant uh, issues uh, with our uh, estimate of the workload. So, um, sorry, I anticipated this slide, but I'll get to it in a second. Um, so, at the time, roughly 40 papers a year were being retracted from the scholarly literature. Uh, we, within about a year, realized that the true number should be closer to 400. It's now closer to 1,600. Um, and it wasn't because uh, it wasn't because there weren't papers to retract. It was because journals were not retracting. They would uh, they would find out about complaints and then sort of just hope that these complaints would go away. Or um, they might retract, but they would uh, offer um, no information about the retraction. It was very common to see a retraction notice that would say something like, um, "This article retracted by the authors." You have no way of knowing if you were a reader whether you could rely on anything else that that research group had produced, um, whether there were uh, things in the data um, that um, were still sort of interesting and worth paying attention to. It was really a black box. Journals were slow, opaque, and inconsistent with how they uh, dealt with retraction notices. Um, it was really uh, a terrible situation in terms of transparency. And so we felt like um, retractions would be a, uh, looking at retractions, studying them, writing about them, would be a good way of sort of opening up this window onto the scientific process. Um, and it turns out that uh, that proved to be uh, a good, uh, good judgment because um, we have uh, now found that there are huge cases of misconduct and, and it's not necessarily misconduct, but uh, retractions that accumulate. Um, we've created a leaderboard on our website, which is free to everybody to see. It's retractionwatch.com. And as you can see, these are the top 10. Uh, I think this is the most recent um, uh, screenshot. Uh, the first one and the second one are both anesthesiologists, actually. And there's a reason that's the case, which I can get into. Uh, the first one is Yoshitaka Fuji, who, as you'll see, has 183 retractions. Uh, he's a Japanese anesthesiologist. He uh, fabricated his results. Um, he actually has outstanding uh, at least 100, if not 200 other studies, which have yet to be retracted, probably won't be retracted uh, because nobody has the patience or inclination to, to look at them. Um, but I think, you know, most people, if they had a CV with 183 uh, retract, uh, papers on it, would be very happy. Not so much if you have 183 retractions. The second fellow, Joachim Bolt, um, recently actually just had another bolus of retractions, but his case dates back to uh, shortly after we launched. Um, and he uh, was a, a critical care specialist um, involved in a lot of research looking at volume expanders. Uh, and actually his, his studies, which bias towards the positive, wound up with what 
many people think is the overuse of volume expanders, especially in Europe during uh, surgery uh, and possibly even a significant number of patient deaths. Um, what you'll notice on this list as you scroll down, and it's actually even true through the top 20 and maybe even to the top 30, is there isn't a single woman's name on that list. So um, I encourage the female scientists out there to either continue doing what they're doing or get cracking on the misconduct or you'll never make it onto our leaderboard. Um, we also, thanks to some generous funding from a variety of foundations, including the MacArthur Foundation um, and uh, the Helmsley Foundation, created a database. We have now the largest database of retracted articles in the world. We have more than 25,000 entries um, dating back for as long as you can look. Um, and we're actually building that basically by hand. We have a researcher uh, who has a PhD in retractions of all things. Uh, and she, with uh, the help of some interns, uh, have been populating this. And we add to it every day. You can, as an individual researcher, go online uh, and scrape it for free. Um, you can look at all these fields and uh, type in whatever you want from the journal to a subject area, to the author, to a reason for retraction. Um, again, it's not complete because we're doing this by hand um, and we have to rely on uh, on a feed of retractions that comes from all sorts of sources but it is the most comprehensive uh, retra retraction beta database around far more than pubmed or or science direct or anything else so uh, i encourage you to use that if you ever want to uh, look at retractions in a particular area um, so why do journals retract uh, prior to the launch of retraction watch there have been some studies uh, which suggested that uh, the bulk of retractions, 65, 70% of retractions, resulted from honest error. Well, that was uh, purely a result of um, what journals and authors wanted peep readers to see. Um, every retraction notice said something to the effect of honest error or uh, this article is retracted. So there was no information. Um, then shortly after we launched, uh, a group of researchers used our data and did a sort of forensic analysis of retraction notices, and they found that the um, that the situation was in fact switched. Roughly two thirds, sixty-seven percent of retractions resulted from misconduct, not honest error, um, and that's misconduct uh, broadly defined as the ORI does, which is fraud, uh, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. So now we know that roughly two thirds of retractions, if you see one, result from misconduct of some kind. Uh, most of the time it's plagiarism, but not always. Um, there is a fair amount of fabrication of data and falsification of data. So what are some of the common reasons for retractions under that rubric? Um, there's duplication, which is self-plagiarism, which is not a uh, which is not a crime uh, that the ORI acknowledges. It's it's really more of a of a of a copyright issue, um, but certainly not best practices. The plagiarism, which uh, everybody should know, what plagiarism means and and how you go about doing it and how you will get caught doing it. Um, image manipulation, and I'll get into that um, more in a bit because it's on the rise. Fake data, obviously. Uh, fake peer reviews. We've seen literally hundreds, uh, multi-hundreds of papers uh, that have been retracted, um, which means there are plenty more out there which have not been retracted, for fake peer reviews. And what I mean by that is um, if you are the editor of a journal and uh, you ask an author for the names of three people who could review uh, his or her paper, um, and uh, they provide you with those names. And those names come back to an account, an email account um, governed by that person who then uh, creates the own reviews and their own reviews. And in fact, there was one guy who was caught fabricating reviews in several dozen papers. And uh, he used to write these really excellent, thorough reviews, very critical, but uh, insightful reviews about his own work. And the reason he got caught was that he once turned around a review in less than 24 hours, which I think for anybody who reviews papers knows that's virtually impossible. Um, publisher error. Um, so sometimes uh, publishers publish things in too quickly they, uh, before the manuscript has been fully edited. Um, or they publish it in the wrong uh, journal, they didn't mean to publish it, or they accepted it, or they rejected it and then published it. Uh, that happens occasionally, and it 
it winds up being frustrating for the authors because then they have to have a retraction on their CV that they didn't necessarily deserve. Um, authorship issues, uh, things like honorary authorship, um, people get put on a paper they had no idea they were on. Um, they have people who uh, thought they should be on a paper or left off and then uh, complain to the journal. Um, more, more often than not, it's that you've been put on a paper. Um, legal reasons, for example, uh, a research team might use data uh, owned by a drug company, for example, that didn't give them permission to, uh, to publish those data. That happens rarely, but on occasion, uh, we see case studies of uh, people um, with a certain condition who initially gave informed consent to appear um, in, in a publication, but then revoked that after publication, um, which is also very frustrating for the authors, but there's really not, no recourse. Um, and uh, we're now seeing, uh, I think fortunately, a, a, an increase in the number of papers retracted for uh, results that are not reproducible. Um, so uh, that's actually you know, how science should be working, uh, trying to verify results um, after publication, but also before publication. Um, and uh, it's good that uh, researchers are trying to have those papers retracted, which doesn't necessarily mean, by the way, completely expunged from, from the, the databases or the world. Um, the best practice for uh, a retracted article is for it to remain online on the journal's website or in a database, such as PubMed, um, with a watermark that reads retracted, or this article retracted, whatever it says, as long as it's clear. And that way, uh, people who see that citation will know that they shouldn't rely on the data, but they could also read the paper, for example, and see maybe what went wrong. Um, so uh, it's very important that, um, that researchers uh, retract results that they were unable to re reproduce, because then it prevents people from running off down blind alleys with scarce resources and, uh, and time. Um, I mentioned image manipulation. Um, as uh, as uh, tools like Adobe Photoshop and, and others have become more common in preparation of images, um, we have seen a, a, an alarming increase in the number of papers that contain images that have been um, inappropriately, inappropriately manipulated. Um, this was a paper um, that got a lot of attention several years ago by Elizabeth Bick and two other researchers, including Farrakh Fang, who's on our board of, uh, of directors. He's a, he's a journal editor and also a microbiologist out in Seattle. And uh, Elizabeth Bick, uh, who is a microbiologist herself, um, has an incredible talent for spotting um, evidence of, of manipulated images. And she did a, a by hand analysis of more than 20,000 papers uh, in the biomedical uh, uh, literature and found roughly 4% contained what she considered to be problematic figures with at least half exhibiting features suggestive of deliberate manipulation. And that she found that, that, that uh, the number had increased significantly over the past decade. Um, she actually, and I'll get to this later, she has uh, a, a Twitter feed, which you can follow, where she uh, asks of her followers to identify uh, the, the problems with images. And I, my mind doesn't work that way. I can't see them, but, but a lot of people can. And she's still hard at work and um, has fans and detractors um, in the field. Um, so I mentioned that the number of retractions uh, when we started out was roughly 40 a year. Um, it's now, as I said, about 15 to 1600 a year. Um, the rate has tapered off because uh, the, the denominator has not stayed the same. The number of papers published each year has shot up substantially. I th think the number is now roughly 2.5 to 3 million papers, 2.5 roughly million papers a year. So as you can see, even at 1,500 or so, the, the um, percentage of papers that get retracted each year is quite small. Um, but we also believe that, and I think everybody believes, the number of papers that deserves to be retracted 
is quite a bit higher than the 1500 or so. And um, I'm sympathetic to uh, journal editors who aren't retracting more because the reality is that um, they just don't have the time to uh, police uh, back issues of, of their, uh, of their uh, journals to see what should be retracted. But um, we're hopeful that we can make a little bit of a dent in, in, in the past, but probably not much. Um, as I said, we're, we're not catching everything. This was a very important uh, article by a fellow named David Allison. I was a nutrition researcher um, who uh, identified with some colleagues a bunch of critical errors in published papers and then sent off letters to the journals uh, where they were published, uh, hoping to prompt corrections or expressions of concern or even retractions. And uh, it get almost no response whatsoever. Um, so um, if if even those sorts of pointed attacks uh, on the edifice fail, then we know that um, there probably isn't much appetite, um, you know, within to to be doing that sort of sleuthing. Um, another significant problem, uh, which uh, we're, we're not seeing much movement on, is contaminated cell lines. I'm sure everybody's familiar with HeLa cells. Um, but those aren't the only ones. This the paper um, that came out in 2017 uh, found or estimated uh, that nearly 33,000 papers include misidentified cell lines, um, which uh, uh, which is you know not a huge number of papers, but it would be a huge number of retractions to come all at once. And those those papers are not getting retracted. So um, you do have to, and there is a there is an outfit that looks at uh, cell line integrity. It's worth paying attention to, to that area if you're doing work uh, with, with cell lines, that particularly uh, in oncology, um, but it's something to, to be aware of. Uh, as I mentioned, there's not a, there wasn't a lot of transparency uh, from journals. There's a little bit more, but we also know um, that retractions uh, tend to, to act like zombies. Um, they persist in the literature, retracted papers, that is, um, because they continue to be cited. This was a paper uh, by John Budd, the first author, and uh, John Budd was, has been an early um, uh, and an influential researcher in retractions. Uh, and the last author is Alison Abritus, who is our researcher. Um, and this paper came out in uh, December of 2016. Um, and they looked at the uh, downstream citations after retraction of articles in the biomedical literature. Uh, and they found uh, a significant number of uh, papers uh, continue to be cited, um, while a tiny number of uh, those citations mentioned the retraction. You can see 4.15% uh, uh, noted the retraction. There was also a, a fairly large number of instances of self-citation of the researchers who retracted the paper or had their paper retracted, but didn't mention that. Um, so. You know, part of this, I think, it makes a lot of sense. You, uh, if you're a researcher and you're relying on paper journals, and some people still do, um, you might remember a paper. You go back to the, uh, you go back to your bookshelf. You pull out the, um, the uh, May 20, uh, 2002 issue of Jack, and you say, ah, that's where it was. Um, and you don't do a search online to find out whether that paper had been retracted. So, okay, that makes some sense. Um, I also think that what part of what happens is that people do sort of a secondary citation where they read a paper that mentioned the citation uh, that they're interested in says, oh, okay, well, I'll just, you know, I'll cite that as well without bothering to do the same kind of search. Um, so it's really important, obviously, to check to see whether a citation that you want to use uh, is still valid. Um, so as they, uh, as these authors wrote, uh, the results uncover profound problem with scientific communication. Approximately 6,400 citations were received by the retracted papers. If those citing papers that could not be located or included, the mean number of citations received by each article that had citations is about 25.6. Many are cited more than 100 times each. Uh, that does strike me as a, as a pretty serious problem. Um, do journals take any steps to get the word about retractions? And you can probably guess from the reason that we're still around is the answer is no. Um, only about 40% of the time, uh, or about 40% of the time, uh, 
the records indicate, and this was looking at a variety of medical databases that the paper had been retracted. Of the 144 articles studied, only 10 were represented as being retracted across all resources through which they were available. In other words, um, it's not enough just to rely on a single database, uh, unless I would say that database is uh, the retraction database that we have, uh, which is which is the most comprehensive. But it may well be, for example, PubMed uh, is quite slow, and you might look at a paper, might look on PubMed to see if something had been retracted, and and it says no. But it's better to go even to the publisher, the journal itself, because there's often quite a long lag. Um, you could also um, use our database, or I mean, uh, Zotero, which is a uh, sort of a citation management system, uh, because we have an agreement with them, uh, shameless plug here, uh, that will link articles in your uh, library uh, to retraction alerts um, and uh, in, in real time. So uh, you can find out whether any papers that, that you want to cite um, or in some uh, bibliography that you're building uh, have been retracted or flagged otherwise. Um, I'd like to take a minute to talk about another uh, issue that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, predatory publishing. Um, so there is there there was a fellow, uh, he's still alive, but not doing this anymore, named Jeff Beal, who was a research librarian in Colorado. And uh, about a decade ago, he started building a list of um, predatory publishers, what he considered to be predatory publishers, which were publishers that would um, uh, that would provide very little in the way of editing and peer review, often none, um, in exchange for money to uh, researchers to buy their way into publication. So that that um, list is now defunct, but there's another group called Cabells, which has uh, taken it up the mantle, and they have a blacklist of predatory journals, uh, which now is in excess of 12,000 journals. Oftentimes, these journals have legitimate sounding names. Um, but uh, there's one that's called, I think, Science and Nature. So if you publish there, you can say you've been published in Science and Nature. Um, but they are not they are not legitimate publishers, and they they often uh, seem to prey on uh, researchers who maybe don't have uh, uh, the strongest command of English or um, who are you know looking to build a CV quickly um, and are kind of desperate for a publication. Um, so how do you spot one of these uh, predators? Um, they have uh, fraudulent websites where they've kind of hijacked a journal uh, to make it look like it's it's real. Um, the owner or the editor of the journal or publisher falsely claims academic positions or qualifications. Um, you, that's a little bit harder to know, but it's a it's a it's a criterion. Um, there's no editor or editorial board listed on the journal's website. Um, that's very easy to find. Uh, the editors do not exist or are deceased. Uh, that's also easy to find if you, uh, if you happen to know the person that they're saying was affiliated with the journal. Um, journal includes scholars on an editorial board without their knowledge or permission. This happens quite a bit, especially with prominent people in a field. Uh, I've, we've we've rip it, written about several uh, big name researchers in all sorts of fields, um, including uh, even Bob Califf. Um, who was put on a journal uh, without their permission or knowledge. Um, falsely claiming indexing in well-known databases, the, the ones listed there. Um, the author must pay uh, page charges or publication fees prior to submitting the article. Um, so uh, if that ever happens, uh, run. Don't, don't, uh, do not do that. Um, article doesn't, the journal doesn't ask for any fees or doesn't indicate any fees. And then chart, you get charged a fee upon uh, submission. Sometimes these fees are huge, you know, six, seven thousand uh, dollars. It's gotten to the point now um, where uh, at least this one group of authors uh, recently wrote an uh, article saying that publishing in a predatory, predatory journal is now a scientific misconduct. And I can understand why, if if you don't do your due diligence uh, and wind up publishing in one of these journals. Um, or you do do your due diligence and wind up publishing one of these journals, knowing that it's uh, that it's not on the up and up. I do believe that is, uh, if it's not misconduct, it's certainly um, it's certainly not good practice, and um, I think you should definitely not be happening. So, how well does cardiology fare? Uh, I did a search this morning. We have 574 entries. Uh, 
uh, using the keyword cardiology in refractiondatabase.org. That represents about 2.3% of the total. So pretty good. Not, you know, it's definitely better than a lot. Uh, um, so what are some of the of the more interesting cases? Uh, this is a case of uh, Nitin Agrawal of Medical College of Wisconsin, who faked data in his PhD thesis in a variety of applications, the NIH, the AHA, uh, and in two papers, and was sanctioned by the Office of Research Integrity. Um, no, no discussion of, of misconduct in cardiology would be complete without a mention of Don Poldermans, whose case is very strange. Um, he was found guilty of misconduct, um, but uh, he actually uh, didn't commit fraud, at least according to himself and to the institution, um, that he was most guilty of really poor lab practices, um, part of which he blamed on having a flood in the lab. Um, but um, the, uh, the outcome uh, was the same. He was dismissed. Uh, one thing uh, that most people agree on, though, is that no patients uh, really suffered as a result of uh, the Polderman's case. Um, there's one retraction and three expressions of concern, so the literature wasn't uh, particularly scathed either. Um, and actually, uh, for our perspective, the, the case led to one of the quickest retractions we've ever seen. Uh, there was a paper uh, that alleged uh, in the European Heart Journal that 800,000 Europeans died um, as a result of uh, guidelines that were in, that included Polderman's tainted research. Um, that uh, that article was pulled within uh, just about 48 hours, which uh, is a record. That's uh, that's incredibly quickly. Often it can take years uh, for journalists to retract articles. Um, there's been some uh, uh, some interesting stuff happening with Valsartan. Um, there was a researcher in Japan who had a major scandal uh, for uh, his work on uh, Velsartan, including data errors and undisclosed conflicts of interest. Um, speaking of Novartis, there was a former Vanderbilt scientist who faked uh, nearly 70 images in six papers, according to ORI. Uh, he then went to Novartis uh, and uh, then quickly got fired. Um, after this came out. But the most famous case uh, involving a cardiologist, um, it, it has to be John Darcy. Uh, that was well before our time. This is an article from uh, uh, Science in May of 1983 by Barbara Culleton, who uh, disclosure was my, uh, was my professor at Johns Hopkins uh, in the 1990s. Um, so uh, Darcy, uh, as many of you uh, probably know, was a, was a highly regarded young scientist uh, in the Harvard system uh, after uh, em being at Emory, uh, and uh, he wound up faking data uh, in at least 17 papers published between 1978 and 1981 in, in very prominent places like New England Journal, Circulation, JCI. Uh, he also lost dozens of meeting abstracts. Uh, what makes the Dar Darcy case particularly interesting as well is that um, he was shielded at first by a couple of people at Harvard, including Gene Bronwald, um, who for whatever sets of reasons sort of looked the other way, um, and uh, and uh, then um, were found uh, the investigation found that Darcy had in fact been fabricating uh, huge amounts of data. Um, uh, Brigham Women's was uh, asked to return one hundred and twenty two thousand dollars in research funding to the NIH, marking the first time that an institution was required to return money to NIH because of research fraud, uh, but not the last. Um, it could always be worse. Uh, this is a story of uh, an AIDS researcher, uh, Dong Pyu Han, uh, who worked in Iowa and uh, was forced to pay back more than $7 million to NIH uh, for his misconduct. Um, he also had a prison term, uh, 57 months, which um, is, to our knowledge is a record for, uh, for a researcher uh, convicted of, of misconduct. Um, and uh, uh, the NIH also never gave the, uh, the university about $1.4 million that they were supposed to. But I, I've painted a grim picture, but things are getting better. Uh, 
one of the things that we're heartened by is the rise of post-publication peer review. Uh, we are very hard on pre-publication peer review, especially when uh, it fails to catch uh, really obvious uh, errors um, or, or uh, shoddy research. We are sympathetic, uh, and I think everybody should be, uh, that peer review is not a good uh, means of detecting uh, fraud and misconduct, uh, su such as uh, data manipulation or fabrication. Um, plagiarism is another thing. Every journal should be using a plagiarism detection software system, like Authenticate, for example. But even Google, if you uh, if you uh, don't have those, um, but it's much much harder to detect um, fabricated uh, images if they're done well or fabricated data. Um, but there is a community of uh, peer reviewers, uh, that is, readers of journals, um, who once an article makes it into print, are, are able to uh, subject it to greater scrutiny. Um, this is a piece about a site called PubPeer, which is a few years younger than we are, founded by a few uh, people in Europe. Um, and it's an anonymized site where you can go on to uh, their search function and type in a journal, an author's name, a paper, uh, other keywords, and you'll find all sorts of comments. Uh, many of them, um, many of them, sort of hortatory about the the nature of a study, but also many saying, "Hey, I think we should check out," uh, or the author should explain why this figure uh, looks different from how it should, or the, you know, the error bars aren't right, or something like that, or I see evidence of plagiarism. So uh, PubPeer um, actually has been sued for um, by, by aggrieved researchers who think that it's unfair, but the reality is it's doing a great service and has led to uh, a large number of retractions of, 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 bad, of bad studies. It's also a, um, a, an encouraging um, development, the evolution of uh, researchers we like to call data sleuths. Um, there are uh, dozens of these people who are uh, poring over their own sort of little areas of, uh, of the literature, looking for uh, everything from um, unreliable results to plagiarism to, as I mentioned, image, uh, image issues. Um, I mentioned Elizabeth Bick before. This is her Twitter page. You can see she has um, I don't know if you can see this, but she has uh, in the top left, there are these, um, these boxes that she puts around uh, the Western blots, for example, uh, directing people to similarities that shouldn't be there. Um, you know, these little furry edges in the tops of the, of the blots, for example. Um, I, it, it's worth just checking her out and seeing what she has to say. Um, and uh, you also, she has a website, scienceintegritydigest.com, which has more comprehensive stuff. Um, Nick Brown on the left here and Jim Heathers on the right. Um, Nick is a, uh, is a psychologist and uh, James is a, um, is a, elect as a physiologist, um, exercise physiologist. He's no longer in academia, but they've developed uh, a couple of sort of brute force, very simple, tools to analyze um, discrepancies in data that require, uh, that, that, were, that warrant uh, further analysis. They call them grim and sprite, uh, and they are ways at looking at the plausibility that results are, are naturally derived. Um, they uh, have, uh, have been instrumental in taking down uh, a couple of, of uh, pretty significant fraudsters um, in, in the psycho in psychology is where they generally focus. Um, another data sleuth uh, was instrumental in uh, demonstrating how uh, Yoshitaka Fuji, the biggest fabricator we've seen so far, uh, uh, how he uh, went about his misconduct. Um, his name is John Carlyle, and he's a, an anesthesiologist, what they call an anesthetist in England. Um, and he uh, did a simulation of, um, of Fuji's results at the prompting of the editor of, uh, of a British journal there that had published some of Fuji's findings. Um, and he found things like the, the likelihood of that Fuji's results would be naturally derived were on the order of one times 10 to the negative 39th. Um, you know, these, these sort of astronomically improbable uh, numbers. So um, Carlisle, uh, he hasn't patented his, his method, but his method is now being fairly widely implemented, especially in anesthesiology, uh, to identify 
sweeping cases of misconduct, and it's it's very effective. Um, journals are also doing their part. Some of them are hiring research integrity monitors and uh, to uh, to deal with misconduct cases, and we're very encouraged by that. We, we'd like to think that we're instrumental in one of them, uh, the Journal of Biological Chemistry, which was one of what we thought was the biggest offenders of meaningless information-free retractions, and we, we beat on them for uh, four or five years, and they finally uh, hired a research integrity czar uh, and are doing uh, much better with their retractions action notices, um, which ultimately means, but it's not for us, it's for uh, readers or scientists who need to know why a journal is retracting a paper. It's not enough just to say that um, the data are unreliable or the authors retracted the paper. You really want to know, was it for misconduct? Was it for something else? Um, uh, Scientists too, I think, are more um, more aware of and more interested in um, correcting the literature in a public way. This is a woman named Kate Laskowski, who uh, is a um, animal biologist. Actually, she studies spiders, um, and she had uh, found uh, concerning uh, data in a study that she had done with a fellow uh, named uh, Scott Pruitt. Um, uh, no, sorry, Jonathan Pruitt. Uh, Jonathan Pruitt is a, a spider uh, researcher who um, would spend a lot of time in the field in South America, Central America, gathering data and sending it back to colleagues who would then write articles. Well, it turns out that uh, Laskowski noticed that some of his data were, were absolutely plausible after they had published a paper. Um, she got a very uh, unsatisfactory response from him. Uh, first, he said he would provide the data, then he couldn't provide the data. And uh, so she decided to retract the paper on her own. That led to um, a massive investigation of Pruitt's papers, um, which are now gradually being retracted. And there may be dozens of papers by this fellow that will be retracted. It's even trickling down to uh, to PhD students. This was uh, this was an interesting story that we had recently about a young woman uh, in England, Suzanne Stoll, who uh, was a graduate student working with some very uh, prominent people in uh, psychology, um, and she discovered an error in perceptual studies um, that uh, applied to a, a very large chunk of that field. Um, and uh, she, uh, the, the, her, her mentor and uh, her co-authors um, were delighted that she brought the, edit, the error to them, although not happy about having to retract it, um, but credit her with, um, with stepping forward bravely to, to correct the literature. So that's, that's all I have prepared. I'd like to uh, thank the MacArthur Foundation, the Arnold Foundation, the Helmsley Trust, Howard Hughes, and the individual donors who uh, keep us going on a daily basis. Um, thanks. So, Gabby, I'll turn it over to questions now. Great. Thanks so much, Adam. That was, uh, that was great and, and very interesting. Um, uh, I'll open up the floor to questions, but, but maybe I'll start just with one. So, you showed uh, a lot of examples, and they were spread over time, and they were spread over fields and disciplines. Um, is this a problem across the industry or is this like if I read the New England Journal of Medicine and Jack and the premier uh, journals, that does this problem go away? It's a great question. And I actually have an answer for it. Um, so um, I mentioned Farrakh Fang earlier. Uh, he did a study which showed that, mm. um, and it's a very, it's a very, gra um, very, very um, obvious curve that the higher the impact factor on a journal, the greater their retraction rate. Mm. Which, when you think about it, makes some sense because more people are reading those papers. So you have more eyes, more scrutiny on the papers. On the other hand, um, there is some truth to the idea that if you are uh, willing to mis commit misconduct in order to promote your career, you're gonna wanna do it in a place that has the biggest possible impact for your career. For example, there was, so you'll shoot for science, you'll shoot for nature, you'll shoot for JCI or Nijim. Um, and there was, a, there was a case that made most of the papers actually a few years ago of a young uh, psychologist who uh, fabricated data in a study that he had done with a fellow at Columbia and used that in a paper uh, in science. 
this was canvassing um, people about their attitudes towards gay marriage. Uh, and he used that one paper um, really to get a job at Princeton. Um, was then retracted, so he lost his job. But the short answer to your question is yes, these premier journals do retract and they re appear to be retracting at a rate higher than, than other journals. Thanks, uh, the floor is open. Well, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask a question. That was a great talk, really, really interesting. Um, one of the principles of science, as you're well aware, is falsification, that, that new science comes along and shows that other, other uh, previous science was, was, was wrong. <clears throat> um, and I think that, that, that when, there, when you're dealing with, with um, fraud or serious misconduct, that's one thing. But I think that, that it becomes difficult when you're dealing with, with science that, that over a period of time has come to be seen as, as, as wrong. And I think a, a lot of that shouldn't be retracted. It was done right according to the, the principles of the, of, of the time. But sometimes it's difficult to say, and I just wonder your, your thoughts about how we handle the problem of updating science, science um, falsifying previous, where, where things were, were, were done with all the best attentions by everybody. And people are fighting it out in literature all the time about what's right and wrong. Well, of course, it's a part of science. Sure. And thanks for that question. And it's it's something that we've grappled with and others have grappled with. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, and I, I hate to speak for Ivan because um, he's not here to defend himself, but um, I think we would agree that there might be room for some sort of middle ground nomenclature where this paper is no longer considered valid but doesn't have to be retracted. I, and I don't think anybody realistically believes that we can go through and retract all the papers that are no longer considered to be, uh, to be true, whatever that means, right? And, and I do believe what you say that um, you use the best equipment and standards of the time and research methods and you know, in 20 years, those have changed. And so of course you're not gonna see the same results. Um, one thing that we are seeing as a, as a corollary to that is, uh, a, a number of papers that journals are withdrawing that aren't necessarily scientific in nature. I mean, some of them are, but but are highly politicized. So, for example, um, things having to do with the way you might treat a, uh, a transgender-oriented child um, psychologically uh, in the 70s not now is considered to be offensive. And so what should journals do, or things that are blatantly racist or sexist, um, you know, fortunately, there's not a huge number of things like that, but they are happening and journals are going back and policing themselves, but they aren't doing the same thing for blatantly false um, study, scientific studies generally. And so uh, they're getting some flack for that. Like, well, you're willing to do, you're willing to police the literature when it comes to hot button political topics of the day, but you're not willing to do it for reproducibility. Um, but I, I think that we, we can't expect them to do it for reproducibility because the numbers are too big anyway. Yeah, um, so I, I just wanted to question about what do we do with it? Because, I mean, with this data, because as you mentioned, there are so many reasons for retraction. And yet the word retraction is a big word and no one actually goes to the reason for the retraction. You know, it's, you may do it. I mean, but for most people, it's either the paper retracted or not retracted. And there is misconduct. I may, as an editor in a journal that is a peer review, can tell you that I find a lot of stuff up front. I don't let it published or even to be reviewed whether, and the main thing is duplication. And today the editorial systems, when you work with Elsevier, you're getting a very nice uh, uh, red signal that this, there may be duplication here. You go through there, then you say, you basically started to see different individuals that continue to do it again and again and again. Uh, so these are not even got to that retraction, but you know, there is a difference between retraction because someone was not happy that his name was not included, that someone falsified the data. And yet on your retraction watch, yes, if you really want to look, you may find a reason for the retraction. I'm not sure again, um, that you're not doing unjustice to some of the papers that although they retracted, they do have a, an important scientific contribution. Uh, so I don't know how you uh, overcome this limitation. That's a big limitation of just saying retracted or not retracted because 
for everyone retracted, it's like a curse, right? It's something that you really don't want to go through. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying. And um, it's a good point. I, I will say that there are some data which suggests that researchers who retract for honest error may in fact see a, a bump in the citations of their future studies because it's a signal to other researchers that they are to be trusted. Whereas if you retract from misconduct, you see an almost immediate drop in citations, uh, which is very hard to overcome. But retracting for honest error uh, doesn't have that, doesn't seem to have that problem, which is why it's so important for journals to have as transparent a retraction notice as possible. Because if I were an author, I would want it said, this is not due to misconduct. This is because we found this error and we felt like it was important to retract it. Um, so yes, it, it, I mean, I, I totally get that retraction is, is you know, it's the scarlet R. Um, if you look in our database or on our blog, uh, we don't put anything on our blog that's just a single word retracted. We always have a story about it and the retraction database tells you why it was retracted fairly in depth. And you can always click through to find the DOI and then go to see it yourself. Um, but it's not like we just have, you know, paper X retracted, paper X retracted. It's, it's much more uh, in depth than that. So, so who is your customers who are actually looking on a daily basis? Like what was retracted today? I mean, I understand Larry Houston, he retired now, but he used to put it like in his cardio brief, it was a daily yeah, yeah. news. Uh, but, you know, on a day to day, I mean, like, <laughs> Who, who is visiting your journal to look for, what's the retraction of the month? I mean, these are the people they're looking for news or if, I mean, I've never looked at the website to see if I'm associated with someone, he has a bad name or not bad name. I mean, it's like, if you can tell me a little bit, who is your customer? Sure. And then I have one more question after that. Sure. So we have um, roughly 7,000 daily subscribers to our e-newsletter. So I'm guessing of those, a uh, hundred might be journalists and the rest are scientists, a few lawyers who are interested in research misconduct cases, um, some regulators, people with ORI. Uh, we have a lot of Rios who are interested in what we do, um, some publishing people, and most of them are, are researchers, uh, MD, PhD types who uh, um, you know are very interested in, in the integrity of the literature. In terms of who goes to our database, I really don't know, um, but it's, um, you know, li medical libraries, for example, have access. And, uh, you know, if you're putting together a, um, a bibliography for somebody, you, you wanna go to our database and find out the integrity of that bibliography. Thank you. My last question is open access journals. Do you find that there is potentially going to be more retraction from open access journals to non-open access journals? Elsevier would like me to say yes, um, but I, I can't speak to that. Um, I really don't know. Uh, um, you know, PLOS One um, has a lot of retractions, a lot of retractions. Um, I don't know what the quality control is in terms of open versus closed. Um, that's really more of a business model. There's no reason that it you should have less integrity of, in, in those papers. What I can say is that predatory publishing is a much greater threat than open access. So, um, and the amount of sort of, I, I left, the, I, I sometimes talk about some of this sort of organized crime, literally organized crime that has, uh, that has um, permeated uh, scholarly publishing there, you know, bags of $500,000 in cash transferred for the, for articles and um, uh, the Russian, um, Russian companies that prepare manuscripts and get them placed in journals. I mean, there's, you can, you can Google some of this stuff. It, it's really remarkable. And so is China as well. Yeah. And you know, the stakes are really high. One of the things I didn't mention uh, are the sort of the, the forces that cause some of this stuff. And it's pretty obvious um, that pressure to publish uh, is behind a lot of this stuff. And we've, we've often thought that there could be um, another metric, a better metric for, uh, for evaluating academic productivity. Maybe it could be something like um, 
you know, how, how many times a paper is cited in a high quality journal as opposed to how many papers you have in a given year. Because if, it's, if, the, if the outcome measure is supposed to be number of papers, then people are going to try to publish as many papers as they can and the quality can't be as good. And they'll, you know, end up publishing the same thing in four different journals and, um, you know, hoping they don't get noticed or uh, not really contributing anything anyway to the science. That's why the impact factor helps. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, hey, um, hey, Gabby, this is Alan. I had a question. No, that was uh, really interesting. As a formal jour journal editor, I can just only applaud the work. Um, uh, how about the other point at which this occurs, and it's even harder to police is abstracts, where there is no real peer review. Um, what, it goes into press. It is uh, often citable, at least for a period of time, and uh, it is, uh, and sometimes uh, that's all that ever appears. And is there a, it, it's probably too big a nut to crack, but I'm just wondering, you know, that even seems a harder thing and, and a bigger risk. Are you referring to meeting abstracts? And meeting abstracts, published abstracts. Yeah, you know. so conference proceedings and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know, they publish the, the, the thousand abstracts that are at the annual society meeting, of sure. the AHA meeting or, or the ACC meeting. Yeah. Um, I mean, we do, we, we actually stopped covering that stuff. Um, yeah. Problem is you can never find, almost never find, a reason that an abstract was withdrawn. And it just was, it, it was not going to be profitable for us in terms of a time management issue. Um, so... You know, it's a good question. I don't know what to do about it. Um, and there certainly are a lot. And I see that from my my day job as the editor of a gastro journal. And we most of what we do, probably 80% of what we do is meeting coverage. Um, so I often see paper, you know, abstracts that have been withdrawn um, and wonder why. There's nothing. We just don't have the, the resources to track that stuff down. Yeah, no, just a... Yeah, but it's a it's an important for, issue. Uh, yeah, for the our fellows and residents listening, I mean, abstracts are not peer reviewed, and they really have a, a much greater risk and chance for errors. And I'm sort of curious. So, in your own experience, what percentage of abstracts say uh, uh, submitted to the um, ACC meeting um, wind up in print? Yeah, um, I, I love I love to know Ron's uh, what number he carries in his head. The number I've always carried in my head is about only about 20% or so of published abstracts ever make it to, at least in full form, uh, in, into print. But uh, sometimes it's absorbed, you know, smaller pieces are absorbed into larger paper, you know, it's, so it's a little bit hard to track, but, but not, it is the, it is the, it is, I won't call it the vast minor, minority, but it's the, a, a, a clear minority of papers uh, make it into print. Uh, you know, Bill or Ron might want to comment. Well, my, my view, if you didn't publish that in a full manuscript or a brief communication that when peer reviewed, the abstracts means nothing and you should not even look into that. Certainly. So, I mean, that's what I tell to all our fellows. Uh, abstract is maybe give you a podium or a place on a poster board, but it, other than that, doesn't mean. I know that they are actually cite, cited in the journals, but you can tell immediately this is an abstract. And if this is an abstract, the value of that by default is very, very little. If you didn't translate the abstract to a manuscript, brief communication, uh, in a peer review fashion, then you should not pay attention scientifically to that too much. But what about when an abstract says, like, you know, presidential poster winner or, uh, ab, you know, means uh, nothing to me? Then, then translate it to a paper. If you cannot translate it to a paper that will undergo peer review, then it's you can do anything in abstract. You can write everything that you want. Most of them are promissory. They're not complete analysis. I mean, they, they have very little scientific value. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't put too much into that. Um, to me, abstracts, again, I mean, I, I'm surprised that they still be cited in index medicus and get the same, you know, they get the line in the index medicus, uh, but then you immediately trace that this is an abstract. So you, you move on. And there are some journals that would not accept references that are citing abstract. They would just require to have a full manuscript and say, don't send me abstract with references. And I think they're right about it. Yeah, I just like to agree with, with Ron on that. There are journals that will not accept ab abstracts. So there are journals that say, 
Um, this abstract is two, year, two years old. By now, it should be a, a paper that will take abstracts for maybe six months or so. And I think Ron's take on it that abstracts really don't are, are not complete science is correct. I think Alan's number is also uh, very close to the accurate number. The vast majority of, of abstracts never never become full articles. But, but you know, it's interesting. I think you're doing a very important job, and, and you know, I commend you on doing it because for those who are interested now, they have a good database that they can look into. Uh, I'm just wondering what is the impact or is there any way that you can measure that by having this website and database, the number or, or was that improving the scientific integrity? Is there any way that you can say, hey, we're doing a good job and by that we contributed to better scientific integrity? Um, well, our parents think so. Uh, no, I, I, uh, it's a good question. It's a fair question. And I think we, we certainly get cited a lot by people who um, know a lot more about science than we do. And neither one of us is a scientist, although I, Ivan is a, is a physician uh, by training. Um, we've been cited hundreds, more than a hundred times, I think, in, in the literature. Um, it's impossible now, in, unless someone's not being honest about it, to see a paper about retractions that doesn't cite us in our database. Um, and we, we get a lot of, of credit in the media, which might not mean much to scientists, but I think shows that, that a lot of what we have done, and part of the reason that we launched our site was because we thought as journalists, these were interesting stories that deserve broader attention. And I think we were right about that. And people, other science journalists and even lay journalists you often look at our site and then bring surface things to the popular attention. Um, funders thought what we were doing was worth giving us a couple million bucks for, um, at least in the past, where uh, th their priorities change. Um, so those are all proxy measures for, I think, for our value. Um, but I also think that um, it's, it's fair to say uh, and you'd have to survey a bunch of journal editors. Um, but I, I think if the you survey journal editors who follow us um, and even publishers, uh, they would say that having um, the threat of, of, have, of being criticized, not by us per se, but by um, others, uh, Reader's Retraction Watch, for example, because um, we have more than 100,000 unique views every month. Um, so lots and lots of people are reading Retraction Watch every month. Uh, the threat of being criticized is sufficient enough to try to ward off those criticisms by making changes to their pra practices and protocols for publishing. And in that sense, I think that we've had an impact. Um, you know, I think JBC would not have hired an ethics czar, except for the fact that we were beating them up every day, every week for crappy retraction notices. Um, and Elsevier, even Elsevier, um, is you know more responsive to uh, uh, to those sorts of things. So um, yeah, I think it's I think it's fair to say that we've, we've made a dent. We you know we haven't turned the ship entirely, and it's not our role to, but we've definitely made a dent. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. I know we're over time, but the um, uh, floor is open for one more question. If anybody has one. I think there's a lot to unpack here and there's a lot more discussion we could have and really appreciate uh, the talk today. Uh, I think this is a, an important topic and <clears throat> we, <clears throat> when we review articles, we talk about the methods, did they use, you know, the right, you know, is there selection bias in the study, et cetera, all the usual things, but it's important to sort of step back and see some of the, the bigger uh, underpinnings of how the scientific literature works. Uh, and some of the issues associated with that. So, Adam, thank you again. We really appreciate it. Uh, and hope Thanks, to have you, uh, back for further discussions. Would love to. And I don't know if I put my email up there, uh, but you have it, I believe. Uh, and so uh, feel free if anybody wants to contact me, I'm happy to take questions offline. Great. Thanks again. Have thank you. Thanks a lot. Great talk. Thank you. All the best.